This lake, called Erie, was formerly inhabited on its southern shores by certain tribes whom we call the Nation of the Cat. They have been compelled to retire far inland to escape their enemies, who are farther to the west. These people have a number of stationary villages, for they till the soil and speak the same language as our Hurons. Jesuit Relations of 1647 Jesuits working in the field sent detailed reports to their superiors in Quebec City, who compiled, edited, and then forwarded the compilations to the Jesuit Provincialate in Paris. The reports were composed of letters to the provincial incorporating excerpts from diaries, logs, and memoirs, all stitched together into relations by the original author as well as by editors and publishers. To this day, scholars still disagree on the extent of transformation from the time they left the Jesuit missionaries until they reached the hands of the readership. The Erie Indian Nation lived around the southern shores of Lake Erie. This is in the vicinity of present-day Buffalo, New York, ranging to Sandusky, Ohio. In the early 1600s, the estimated number of Erie natives is about 14,000. The French called the Erie Indians the Nation of the Cat because of the cat-like fur they were known to wear. The Erie Indians belonged to the Huron-Iroquois branch. The name Erie is derived from the word Erie a word that means long tail in the language of the Iroquois. The Erie managed to elude contact from European colonists. Apart from one brief encounter with French Jesuits, the French were not able to reach them. Either were the Dutch or the Swedes, although both did hear about them from other native tribes. Information about their culture and living conditions have therefore been passed on to historians through second-hand accounts from members of other tribes, most notably the Huron. From them, we learn that the Erie lived in scattered villages which were stockaded for protection. Their homes were traditional longhouses that could house up to several families. They were farmers and hunters like most of the surrounding tribes. Their main crops were corn, beans, and squash. Regardless of the extent of direct contact between Europeans and the Erie Nation, the presence of Europeans on the American continent had profound consequences on the Eastern Woodland tribes. Traditional intertribal relationships and balances of power were turned topsy-turvy by the mechanisms of the fur trade. Attempts to control hunting grounds, transportation routes, and favorable trading sites became a driving force in Indian diplomacy, aggravating old hatred and creating new ones. Although the Erie did not have contact with the Europeans, they did obtain European trade goods from the Susquehannock. The Susquehannock were, however, careful to make sure that the Erie were not able to get their hands on the prized European possession, the firearm. During the early 17th century in New France, gun sales were limited to Christian Indians. This policy would ultimately prove calamitous to the tribes trading with the French. The number of guns in the hands of the Iroquois at this time drastically increased, for they were the closest to the Dutch fur trading centers in New York and also the British settlements in Connecticut and Massachusetts. In about 1575, the great leader Hiawatha forged the Iroquois Confederation. The Huron, also an Iroquoian people, but not part of the League, were a much more numerous and powerful people than the Five Nations. But in 1636, 11 years after the Jesuit missionaries first came into their villages, an epidemic, possibly the bubonic plague, decimated the Huron population. By 1639, the 32 villages of Huronia had been reduced from a total population of approximately 40,000 to half that number. It was at that time that forest economics compelled the Iroquois to look to the north and west for more furs. Quite simply, the beaver of the New York area were all but gone. Prices paid in guns and other trade goods for beaver pelts at Albany rose dramatically compared to those paid at Quebec. A decade of Iroquois piracy ensued, culminating in the outbreak of the Wars of the Iroquois, an all-out attempt to establish themselves as the middlemen in the fur trade in 1649. Their depredations against their fellow red men have been aptly designated the Beaver Wars. The Iroquois War with the Erie began in the summer of 1654 and lasted till about the end of 1656. This was in striking contrast to the single week of war it took to overcome the Huron in 1649. The first major battle of the Iroquois Erie struggle began on the morning of August 15, 1654. The Iroquois attacked with stunning swiftness, catching the Erie by surprise. One by one, the villages fell, and a stream of refugees, ultimately numbering around 6,000 with 2,000 warriors, 
For five days, the Erie fled through the forest, closely pursued by the Iroquois. Unable to escape, they built a fort of wood with palisaded walls. The siege of the Erie fort was a long and costly one. Although the Erie warriors outnumbered the Iroquois, they were burdened by the presence of their women and children, and they had very few guns and barely any powder. The end came with near exhaustion of Erie arrows and an Iroquois decisive stratagem. They decided to use their long war canoes as shields to ward off the volleys of poisonous arrows as they approached the Erie works, driving back the entrenched defenders with muskets and then inverting their canoes to use them as scaling ladders to get up and over the palisaded walls. As their enemies scaled the walls, more than 300 of the Erie defenders broke and ran, leaving their comrades, women, and children behind. Once in the fort, the Iroquois commenced a systematic butchery of its occupants, the carnage being so great that blood was knee-deep in certain places. On September 11, 1654, the Iroquois had their single but costly victory at the palisaded fort the Eries had made. The war then continued to rage on through 1655 and into 1656. The principal fortified towns had already been destroyed, so now the Iroquois strategy shifted for the elimination of the last remote villages and indeed the last remaining Eries wherever they could be found. After the decimation of the Eries uh, by the Iroquois, came some evidence of cultural assimilation of the Eries into the Seneca tribe. This would make sense because the Seneca were the closest out of the five Iroquois tribes to the Eries. Today, Seneca are predominantly located in Oklahoma, and many historians argue that some are modern-day descendants of the Erie people. This would be proving that the Erie's culture is still present in North America today.